Okay, so welcome and thank you for coming to this email marketing masterclass. And today I'm going to be talking about everything email marketing. I'm going to start with just an introduction to email marketing. What is it? Why do it? Why does it matter? Um, why add this to the balls that you're juggling around marketing your food enterprise? Um, I'm going to do an overview of what GDPR is. Um, you've probably heard about it if you are marketing your food enterprise. So just some um, the kind of main things to consider around this and how to make sure that what you are doing with your email marketing isn't putting you in any danger around GDPR. Um, I'm going to go into some bits around sending emails. Uh, this is going to be quite um, focused on MailChimp. So it's going to be quite a lot of uh, information about MailChimp in this session. Um, so the sending emails, we'll be looking at that in a bit more detail. So if you don't use that already, then this will be a really nice um, introductory space to look at using MailChimp for your email marketing. And if you are using it, you might learn some new ways of doing things or some ways to optimize what, what you've already got set up there. Um, then I'm going to go into how to grow your audience. And this is going to be very targeted towards food enterprises. So there might be some things here that you're not thinking of already. And then I've got a couple of extras at the end. I've got an email marketing checklist that I'm going to share with you, which is something that you can take away after this class and kind of go through it and just see where you are with email marketing and if there's any extra bits that you can do to get better results with it. And then hopefully we'll have a small time for a Q&A at the end. So first of all, why care about email marketing? Um, why do we want to do it? And I think the main answer for this is that it's just simply one of the most effective ways to reach your customers. People are five times more likely to see an email from you than they are to see a post that you post on Facebook. And that's to do with the Facebook algorithm and most of the social media platforms have one, um, which means that you can always be certain that what you're posting is seen by your followers. Whereas with emails, around 90% of emails are actually delivered into um, people's inboxes. So you've got a much higher chance of actually getting in front of your customers or your audience with an email that you sent, which is great news, which is why to take your email marketing seriously. And if you're not doing it already, to definitely get started with this. Um, also, it's really great for when you're sending orders, like call reminder emails, for example, if you're using the OFM platform, because emails have a 66% higher conversion rate um, compared to social media posts. And what this means is that people are much more likely to take a buying action from an email that they receive than if they see something on a post. So if you're sending an email that says visit our shop to place your order, people are 66% more likely to take that action to visit your shop than they would be if you said the same thing in a social post. And the other reason is that if you are acquiring kind of new followers that haven't shopped with you yet onto your email list, so you're taking people maybe from being social media followers onto an email list onto your um, into your email audience, then it's actually 40 times more effective to, to convert them then into a customer with your food enterprise than if they were just a follower on say Facebook, for example. Um, so this is why we should care. And then also I wanna talk about why MailChimp, um, cause I'm gonna be covering a lot about MailChimp in this session. And the simplest answer to this is that there are lots of different email um, sending platforms that you can use. Uh, but MailChimp is one that is, is free up to, I think, still 2,000 subscribers. Um, and the other reason it's really simple and easy to use, and another reason is that it makes being GDPR compliant really simple for you because it's got everything like in the, so in the platform that will help you to make sure that you're collecting emails in a GDPR compliant way. And then also it's helping your um, subscribers to unsubscribe from you should they wish to. So it's just a way to, to, yeah, to help you make sure that you're adhering to those rules. Having said that, I'm gonna go a bit into GDPR now um, and talk about you know, what is GDPR? Um, what are the rules? And uh, or particularly, how are the, what are the rules that apply to you? And hopefully try and explain them in a way that, that, makes, that makes sense to you. Because when you're thinking about GDPR, it can seem like this big um, complicated thing. So I think I've just got someone in the waiting room. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, so GDPR stands for the General Data Protection. Oh gosh, why do I always forget this? <laughs> Just, but basically, it's um, a policy, a legal policy that was created in 2016, and it became live, I think, in 2018, around then. 
Um, and it's a way, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a positive thing for us as um, recipients of emails as well as people that send emails because simply it just means that companies are, it's enforced that companies look after your data and keep your data safe. Um, and it also means that you, people can't just send um, unrequested marketing emails just to, you know, to, to people. So it essentially protects your inbox and it stops you from receiving as much spam. And it also means that for companies as well or businesses who are sending emails, it, it actually is, I feel, a trust positive thing. Because if you're adhering to the GDPR rules, like essentially those rules, by taking these actions to keep your customers' data safe, um, it's actually a positive trust point between you and your customer that you're respecting their information. And also if you're not sending kind of unsolicited marketing emails, again, this is a positive trust thing between you and your customer. So I'm sure you're not doing any of these things um, more like breaking these rules anyway, you probably weren't before GDPR came in, but it's actually these rules are quite positive because it's keeping people's data safe. Um, and so here's a kind of overview of the rules of what you need to make sure that you're you're doing as your food enterprise and this is for small businesses and big businesses the same so you want to make sure that you're only collecting data for a specific purpose and that you're not collecting it data for any other purpose so what that means is that if you're collecting people's name and email address you want to make sure that you're only using that for the rule for what you said you're going to use that for so it means that when you're taking someone's email address and name and you say i'm going to send you a uh, newsletter once a month then strictly speaking, you wouldn't then be able to send them order cycle reminders. So it's just a way of being really explicit about what you're gonna use that information for and sticking to that. And again, this is a really positive thing with your, uh, it's for building trust with your customers. It's essentially you say what you're gonna do and then you do what you say you're gonna do. Um, and you must have consent to use this data for the purpose that you want to use it for, that you've explicitly said you'll use it for, and then make it really easy for people to draw consent. And this is the point where MailChimp makes this really easy for you, because when you're building landing pages, which are GDPR compliant, essentially um, you have an opt-in form when you explicitly say what you're going to use the data for, and then people can opt in and essentially they give their consent to you to use um, the email address for the purposes that you said to them that you use it for. And also with uh, MailChimp emails, you've got an easy unsubscribe option. So it makes it really easy for them to withdraw consent. Um, so that's actually, again, a really positive thing for building customer trust that you're adhering to these rules. Um, and also only hold the minimum amount of data necessary for the consented task and only keep it for as long as necessary to complete this task. And what that means as well is that if, you're just to, if you just want to send people an order cycle reminder email and you want to send them a newsletter, then you won't really need any more data from them than their name and their email address. So if you then start asking them, like, requiring more information like it's just yeah it's like don't collect any more data than you need to fulfill the function that you need to fulfill so for example you wouldn't ask like you know what gender are they for example so it's it's just being really sensible about the data that you're collecting from your customers and the final point is to make sure you're keeping the data safe and again this is how um, MailChimp can make that easier for you because if you're storing your audience in MailChimp um, then you're benefiting from MailChimp security. But then if you, for example, are just keeping um, a list of emails in a spreadsheet on your computer, and if your computer isn't password protected, then essentially you're not keeping that data safe. And it's, yeah, just imagine a scenario when you might have to explain to a customer, I'm sorry, I've lost your data. That wouldn't be a very fun conversation to have. So it's good that you're keeping your data safe. So if you're using MailChimp, that, that's somewhere where you can keep that data. But if you are keeping a spreadsheet of your customer's data on your computer, just very simple things like making sure your computer is password protected um, can really help here. Um, and you can even keep those spreadsheets password, you can even create password protected spreadsheets as well. So it's just always having this mind on keeping data safe. Um, so I'm gonna go into more details of what this, what this might look like with your email marketing and how that looks on MailChimp as we go along. But I just wanted to do like an overview of the main points about GDPR that will make sense to you and that matter to you as a small enterprise. Um, just, is there anything else I wanted to say here? Okay, I just check that there wasn't. Um, there's something I wanted to say, and that is that there might that there is actually a little bit more leniency in relation to non-compliance for small businesses. 
And that is in the case of if you're emailing customers, existing customers, um, and you might not have their GDPR compliant opt-in to receive emails from you. Um, so, and this is because they're a current customer, so you've legitimately got a, a reason to be contacting them, say, for example, about their order. So when you're contacting customers about their orders, that's, GD, that's compliant with GDPR because you're contacting them about a specific reason that they've opted into by shopping with you. So that this then, it means that it's very low risk, for example, if you wanted to do an opt-in campaign where you emailed your existing customers with a link to your landing page and asking them if they'd sign up for your official mailing list, which would then mean it's safe to then, once they've then opted into receiving marketing emails from you, then you could contact them about order recycle, um, order cycle closing emails if you use the OFM platform, or you could then send them, update them with your monthly newsletter. So it's, yeah, it's the fairly lenient with smaller businesses around that if they're, if this is a customer that is, has this kind of buying relationship with you already or uses your service, for example, if um, I think in your case, Joe, maybe. So, okay. So here's how to create a GDPR OK landing page. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to show you, um, and this might then reveal to you. Uh, uh, can I just get a show of hands? I, who's using MailChimp already? OK, Joe, Katie. And Jill isn't, so okay, so this is cool because I'll show you this and this means that when you set up MailChimp, you can then use this. Um, but also just to let you know that the next couple of slides, it looks a bit more complicated than it actually is, I've put like a step-by-step -step, um, with visuals guides. You can, when you're setting up MailChimp, you can then find out exactly how to do this. And there's also a little blurb, which will make more sense in a second, that you could copy paste um, yourself into the, the, the message for GDPR compliance and just tweak it so it's somewhere to get started with it. This will make more sense when I show you now. So bear with me. Um, cool. So I was gonna start a new account and take you through the steps, but I'm a bit concerned about having time to get through everything we wanna go through today. So I might already be locked in. Um, Up. It was just taking a while to load. So that was the main page and you click log in um, in the top right corner and you get this option here to create a new account. Did I just notice a, have I got anyone waiting in the waiting room? One second. No, just check. The, okay, cool. Um, regulations, sorry, coming back to the chat from earlier. I don't know why I had a brain freeze then. I think it's the heat. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to log into a current account and, or would it be useful? To, okay, I'm going to use a current account because Jill, it's really, um, it's really intuitive when you first set up an account for the first time, you just create an account and it will walk you through step by step how to create your own account. So when you've then created your own account, I'll tell you at the point when it will look like what I'm doing now so that it makes sense for you. So I might use um, this one today and I've got permission to use this one for a webinar, so. And okay, verification code. Just be back in a second. I'm just gonna get this verification code. I'm still here. I feel like this is probably the most disjointed webinar that I've given in a while. So I'm just getting the code from Gmail so that I can log in. So this is something good to know, like um, MailChimp always has um, this two-step verification, which is great because it means that it's extra safe. I might have to log into a different one. The code hasn't come. One second. Okay, let's go to this one. Uh, 
And the reason I want to walk through um, how to do this is because of every food enterprise I've worked with on setting up um, MailChimp that's GDPR compliant, um, at no point have I worked with one that had already set this up. So it's something that you might not have realized you needed to do. So, um, okay, that should have arrived. I just had a beep upstairs, which means it should be in the inbox. Two eight six eight hundred. So, if you're working with a team, this can become quite annoying if if multiple people are working on Mailchimp because you need to get this verification code sent. So, I'd get it set up with a shared email address that everyone can access. Um, the other thing is, all have it set up with um, security questions that everybody knows the answer to. Um, I've continually had this issue of like people not being able to access the um, uh, the email address to then get the verification code and all of these things. So, okay, so on the main, so this, so for Jill, if you've not used Mailchimp before, this is what your main. Once you first logged in, once you first created an account, your main page like this. If you ever want to go to your dash dashboard and just kind of go back to base, essentially. It's the mushroom in the top, uh, mushroom? Mushroom's on the brain. The uh, monkey in the top left-hand corner will always take you back to your main page. So don't be too overwhelmed with what might look quite complicated, um, a complicated interface at the beginning, because it's actually very intuitive when you start using it. You have a menu on your left here, which gives you all of the different options. And so you've got your, and to get GDPR set up, which will be the first thing I'd recommend that you do before you create a landing page where you can collect people's emails, is you go to audience. And in audience, you go to manage audience. And here you wanna to go to settings. And again, for you to follow after this class, I've got the step-by-step -step, um, as well in the slides that I'll share. So when you've gone to settings, you'll see this option, GDPR fields and settings. So you wanna click on that and what it will do will open up this form essentially. So you can call it anything you want. Um, I'd call it something like marketing permissions. And here's a description. So this is, I would always tweak this and make this really personal for you and your audience. Cause essentially this is where you're requesting your audience's permission to send them the emails that you're gonna send. So for example, here we've, um, and I've put like a, a template that you can use in the slides um, to get started with and tweak this for your own enterprise. But here we, I've said that we'll only use your email to let you know about new offerings, to share useful information and send you a monthly newsletter packed with growing tips, et cetera. So here it's saying that we'll let you know about new offerings. So that's opening up the consent to send them essentially marketing emails for about it. So if you've got something that you're launching, a new service, a new product, um, or a new um, order cycle, um, you change your order cycle uh, dates, then this is giving you open permission really to talk about any of those things with this audience. So you wanna make sure that this is comprehensive and that you're including in here everything that you might want to email your audience uh, about. And this goes back to the GDPR rule about collecting people's emails and being very explicit about what you're going to use that for and then only using that information to, yeah, um, to do what you said you're going to do. And so I'm, I'm kind of laboring that point, but I think it's really important. Um, and hopefully, I mean, this would never be a problem for you because we're, uh, if, you, if you have a small business, but it's just really good to be aware of this because you just, you just never know and the fines are quite considerable. Um, so yeah, so you just make sure you put in a great description here. Um, you can also use this space to re-explain the benefits for people signing up. So for example, um, if you have an, if you're using the Open Food Network platform, you could say never miss an order cycle again. We'll send you a reminder every week. So it's like explaining why that would be useful for your for your customer is a, is a good shout here. And then um, this is where you're saying how you will contact your customers. So here. Um, this email list is only contacted via email, but you can add options here for other ways of contacting people, which is, you know, if, for example, if, um, if you have a charity, you might want to contact people by post and you might be collecting uh, like postal addresses. 
in your landing page. So here you might want to add that option. And again, you're getting that consent from that person. Um, and this is really positive for customer trust or trust from your audience because there were like the fact that you're asking for their consent is like a, a very subtle kind of trust point. It's people like to be asked if that's okay. So, and then here's the legal te text, which is just you can unsubscribe at any time. And so then here you just save the form and I'll show you how that shows up. I'm gonna minimize the videos. And then here, save GDPR settings is here. So we save that. And then if you wanna go, if, so for you Jill to build a landing page, you wanna to go to create and then follow the instructions to build a landing page. I'll share details and a really good step-by-step -step of how to do that um, in the event pages for this event. And for now, I'm not going to go into that too much right now, but I am going to go into what this would look like on an existing landing page. So if you want to find anything that you've created, be that um, a welcome email, be that a uh, landing page or an email that you sent, they're stored in campaigns, which can sometimes not seem very intuitive. I can fit, but... And so here you can see um, emails that have been sent and you can also see landing pages and you can filter here so we want to look at landing pages so that I can show you what, a GD, what this then looks like for the user when they, when they see this. So if I look at the landing page here, I'm going to open this. And you can see the details here. And here is where we'll look at the design. So an edit design. And so we should be able to see the GDPR settings at the bottom. Or if not, I'll take us to the landing page. And you'll see what I mean. Sorry, my internet's being a bit slow. I just want to check if if I'm if there's any connection issues. If um, you could just unmute and let me know, and I'll move on to my phone hotspot because I've been having quite a few issues today. Um, okay, so if we look at the landing page, so I'm gonna so this is the landing page in the builder. Um, which if you've been using MailChimp, you'll, you'll know how to use this. But again, Jill, when I share information on building a landing page, um, I'll explain how to use this as well. And, or if you want to come along to the workshop tomorrow, I can, I can show you. Um, so you can see here at the bottom, this is then automatically brought into every landing page that you create for this audience. So this isn't something then you have to worry about when you're building a landing page. It's just automatically there. And you've got then the description that you've put in. This is where um, the or like the the person would then click to essentially permit you to then send them emails. And so this is then what that would look like. Okay, so that's how to set up a GDPR compliant landing page. Does that make sense for everyone at the moment? Is there is there any issues with that explanation? Um, and has everyone has everyone already done that, or is this something that you're now going to be doing for your for your enterprise? Joe, can I just ask a question? You're talking about a landing page, so I'm getting a bit brain dead here. So where actually is that landing page? Because I've used a sign up form before, so mm -hmm. I've got a link, and we've emailed that out, and clients have kind of gone not clients, whoever has gone through and entered their information. What's the landing page? Sorry, I missed where this is and what where people see that. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. I guess I should have explained that in a bit more detail. And if you've been using a sign-up form, have you been using a sign-up form with um, MailChimp or has it been with... Yeah, okay. MailChimp. So, yeah. so a landing page is a sign-up form. So sorry, that's me um, with my languaging. So a landing page is essentially a sign-up form. It's the place okay. where people land to then input their email address. So that would then be the link. So if I go back here... Um, Again, my slow internet. If I go back here, you'll see the link um, for the email sign up page or the landing page. Same thing that you can, so it'll be here in the URL. So you can then share this, um, share the link. And that's the link that you're normally sharing when people come to that form. So essentially, what we've done in the back end is we've added a GP, GDPR compliant addition to that sign up form that wouldn't normally be there. Um, and then that just means that you're collecting these emails in a GDPR compliant way. If you've been collecting emails with a landing page that doesn't have that form, it could be said that it's not strictly GDPR compliant because sadly, just clicking the subscribe button is no longer um, since the GDPR um, regulations came into place. 
it's no longer an explicit symbol of consent to receive an email from you. So that means that it's very important to get this form on your sign up page. Um, but when you do the steps that I've just said, the sign up pages that you already have will automatically then pull this through. So you won't have to actually change anything on your sign up pages. That will just happen in the back end of MailChimp. And then your sign up pages will all have this GDPR compliant form on them if they've been created in MailChimp. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, sorry about that. Sometimes landing pages, sign up forms. Um, it's because it's called a landing page on um, uh, MailChimp, but it's the same thing as a sign up form. So I hope that was helpful. And that's just a way to just make sure that what you are collecting is compliant. Um, and this is just, I mean, this is taking out the risk. I mean, this is definitely being um, very cautious. So, but it's, it, it's definitely worth having that in place because then it just means that if you ever have any issues, then you can show that you've been making, taking due diligence and collecting this um, extra permission. So, okay. So I'm going to move on from GDPR and just talk just a few tiny tips about your landing page um, um, or sign up form. So when you're creating your sign up form or landing page, you really want to have in mind who's it for. And thinking from a food enterprises point of view, is this to collect emails from existing customers? Is this potentially to kind of woo new customers? Um, so it's really thinking about who you're talking to and trying to use really inclusive language for all of them. If you're really just trying to collect the emails of cu customers that shop with you currently, um, you could, for example, put like a nice big thank you in there that kind of, you know, like massive thank you for all of the support that we've received from you so far, um, and then in inviting them to join your mailing list. But it's just thinking about languaging that if your land page is being used for current existing customers, potential new customers, and generally people who are just interested to find out more about you before they buy from you, then you want to kind of tweak it in a way or the language in a way that speaks to all of those people. Um, so it's good sometimes to look at different examples and maybe I can share some examples of food enterprises after this session in the event page so you can have a look at how other food enterprises are doing it. Um, the other thing which is a really nice thing to do that I don't see many people doing is including some social proof in your landing page. Um, and that could be in the form of a testimonial or some, if you've got anything that has, you know, that um, existing customers have said about you. It's just another point to be able to kind of share those positive stories. And if it's a new customer or a, you know, a potential customer that's just starting on their journey of getting to know you better as an enterprise, then it's a really good thing to be able to show that customers are already happy shopping with you. Um, and I'm sure I've shared this statistic with you before, but 85% of customers trust online reviews as much as personal recommendations. So there's always space to be really um, getting your positive uh, mess like messages from customers in all of these different places so that people will consistently trust your enterprise, particularly at a point when they are taking a next step of uh, connecting with you. Because there's something quite like personal about your inbox. Like so oftentimes the emails that you're sending are in the same space where people might be receiving emails from their friends and family. So it's just remembering that this is a, yeah, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's like an extra trust step to be giving that information for some people. For some people, they don't see it that way. But And also, you can set up on MailChimp an automatic welcome email, which is a really nice touch um, for new people who have signed up to your mailing list. Um, and you could send a nice big thank you for signing up. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the next slide. So now I'm going to go a bit more into sending emails. And so to send a welcome automation, what, you know, you remember I showed you a second ago, the menu on the left in MailChimp, you've got this like snazzy squiggly looking thing, which is where you can find automations. Some of the automations I think are on maybe the higher pricing plans on MailChimp, but you can set up a welcome automation um, at, on a free account. So you want to go here and then you just go through, you can just choose, intuitive to find, you can choose to set up a welcome email from the drop down, And then you can go through the process of building this beautiful welcome email, which is a very similar process to building your newsletter. So you just can create something really nice. And it could just be really, really simple, just like welcome, thank you so much for subscribing. Um, really looking, yeah, and yeah, so whatever kind of language you speak to people about, 
you might want to include in there um, more information or you could include links that if you want people to then interact with your website or to then maybe follow you on Facebook, if they're not already, you can add extra links in here to just take them further on that journey of connecting with you in more places. So it's a good thing to do to set these up. And so this is specifically for people who are using the OFN already is um, the first thing that I would get started with, with sending regular emails is sending a regular weekly order cycle reminder email. Or if you're not doing like a regular weekly thing and you're more kind of ad hoc, so say if um, you're a meat producer and you only have things to sell um, when you do a sorter, then you might want to do this like every month or every couple of months or, or however works for you. But make sure you're sending order cycle, like you're sending emails to let people know that, you, that your shop is open or that you're taking orders. And the reason why is that on average um, enterprises who send a reminder email, get 10% more revenue for what that, so it really does impact your, your sales figures by sending this email, even if you have a small. And I think that stats like across the board, so we've got a lot of small um, enterprises as well on the OFN. So even if you're small, it still has this effect. Not just, uh, not that you're small, sorry, but if your audience is small, it still has this positive effect. And so whenever you are, yeah, so with your order cycle reminder emails or a reminder to buy or a prompt to engage email, which I would call like essentially like a sales email, um, you really want to remember the main goal of this email is, for example, to entice people to come and shop. Um, so it's you want to prioritize that action. So rather than having this like, lovely newsletter with lots of information and then having like, oh, order cycles open the shop now at the bottom, you really wanna make sure that the action you want people to take is the clearest action to take. And this counts for any email. So if you're sending a newsletter, if you want people to engage, so decide the, prior, the order of information, the order of priority of the information that you're putting in the email. So the most important thing, the most desired action for your audience to take is always first. If you really want your audience to know something about you and learn something, um, so if it's like an informative email, the thing you most want them to know is at the top. Um, and yeah, for the order cycle reminder, it's the shop now action. So don't be afraid of putting that quite explicitly at the top and having like the button um, quite close to the top as well. So it's easy for them to take the action and maybe later in the email or as they scroll down, you might then put who are any new suppliers this week or any um, hero um, produce that's, you know, anything that's just amazingly new and in season. And then that's when you can give them more information. But the first thing is always the action you want people to take. And also I would never put more than three links in any email, including a newsletter. If you find yourself having long newsletters with like 10 items in, enticing people to go different places, like read this blog, do this, go here. Um, I'd suggest maybe sending a newsletter more often, like every other week, and then shortening them um, and just being really kind of strategic about what is the most important information that week or that, um, that fortnight or that month, um, just because you'll find that the results you get from that email are better when the email is clearer about what you want people to do and where you want them to go. And you're not giving them lots and lots of options and lots of information. Um, and you'll see that yeah, when you're reviewing your statistics, you'll find that you'll get better results. And always as well, um, thinking about the value of email and remembering the benefit to the customers. So if with an order cycle reminder email, the benefit is that they don't forget to order with you before your order cycle closes and then miss out on their shopping that week. So it's just, while you're writing, it's just helpful to have the benefit. Um, so I know probably, maybe not anyone that's here today, but I, it can be quite particularly if you're a very small business, um, sometimes you might get into the mindset that you're bothering people with emails. And so it's, I think it's really important when you are sending emails to your customers to really remember the benefit of what you're sending in the email and just try and maintain that your customers have given, your permi given their permission for you to email them so they actually want to hear from you. And so try and not see what you're sending is, is bothering your customers. And so here's just a couple of little tips about a newsletter. Um, and that's just, I mean, it's the same kind of tips for most content, really. It's trying wherever you can write 
we talk kind of customer at the center. So using a lot of you and yours instead of I and we. So if you're kind of talking about your enterprise, how can you then make it more about your customer? So rather than like, we have lots of great fresh produce this week, could you add something there? We've got lots of great produce this week that you and your family can enjoy. It's just these slight tweaks that just make it more like you're developing an actual conversational relationship with the person who's receiving the email rather than this kind of broadcast of like, this is what we want you to know and this is what we want you to do. It's like, and it's also making your customer recognize what's, what's relevant to them. Okay, time. okay, so make it as engaging as you can. Um, so have a think about, is it educational? Does it provoke positive emotions? Um, and is it entertaining? So if you've got like a really information heavy, um, you've got a lot of information you want to share, is there anything you can do to bring some kind of levity in it, like a, like a positive news story, or maybe you have a really positive testimonial that week, or a positive case study? Um, so it's just like trying to kind of balance it out so it's, it's not like too much education. And it's, yeah, so that just then means that the information that you want your customer to connect with or to retain is more retainable because it's not just like a wall of information. So it's just always thinking about things from, your, um, from the audience's point of view. And this is back to my point about keeping it succinct. Um, even I would say three images, three links. And if you're going beyond that, just make sure that, yeah, just like know that then, yeah, like that's the ideal is to just keep it a bit shorter. Though there are always exceptions to the rule. I know one food enterprise who writes the most amazing um, newsletters that are just this like beautiful meandering, um, lovely series of really great stories that they get really high engagement to all of their stories. Um, and they usually put about six or seven things in their email. So it really depends on your audience. They've got an unusually engaged audience um, for lots of different reasons. So it's, yeah, it's on a case by case, but I would say if you're starting out short and sweet uh, is best. Um, so a few tips on growing your audience. So the first thing I want to say is that you can actually set up uh, and we can set up an integration um, with the OFN and MailChimp, which means that whenever a customer takes an action or buys with you on the OFN, they then automatically get subscribed to your MailChimp list in a GDPR safe way. And that's something about, because we send like a double opt-in, it triggers a double opt-in email where they take that consent action in the double opt-in email. But anyway, um, if you want more details on this, uh, feel free to contact me directly because this is something we can get set up for you. Um, this is a great way to start building your list. Um, if, yeah, because every time you get a new shopper on the OFN, they will automatically get an invite inviting them to sign up for your mailing list. So it means a lot less work for you. And the other thing you can do, and so this is when I said earlier about there are, when, I, when we were talking about GDPR and I said that it's very low risk for you to contact an existing customer on an existing service user that's using your services or buying from you. And that's because they've already consented to talk to you, to hear from you about that thing. So it's actually quite low risk to contact a customer um, to ask them to sign up to your mailing list. So you, I've, I've developed a step-by-step -step guide here, which is very specifically for shop friends for, for the OFN of how to write an email to your existing customers requesting them to sign up to your mailing list in a way that's fairly safe. So if you're just getting started with MailChimp and you're normally just emailing your customers, then this is a great thing to do now because it's taking all of your customers who you currently are in an email relationship with on it when you're talking about their orders, then taking them onto your mailing list so you can then send them marketing emails. So this is actually, this, this was when Helston Local Food Hub was starting out, they um, doubled their subscribers by doing this. And so the step-by-step -step is really easy to follow and it's just sending a personal email um, and you can maybe BCC people. And also from with the OFM, we can send you a list of your, I think we might, ha I might have instructions here of how to do it, no. Um, instructions of how to get a list of your uh, emails of your current customers. Do not then take that list and put it straight into your MailChimp and email them through MailChimp. Um, contact those customers through the normal methods that you use to email them because they haven't actually subscribed to your mailing list. They're just, so yeah, I hope I've explained that okay. Um, and some other ideas for growing your email list. There's lots of different things you can do. I know food enterprises, I think this was Tamer Valley Food Hubs, they started 
they got QR code stickers and they put that on their their boxes and their bags or and so that's just a way that like obviously not everyone knows how to know use a QR code but then if you're face to face with people you can explain what it is and tell people they can do that quite easily with their phone and then that QR code takes them to the email landing page the link, the sign up, sign up page and then they can add their details there in a GDPR compliant way and be added to your mailing list. So these are just, that's just one idea. Do I have any other ideas that I thought of? Um, and you could also, yeah, you could also put a note um, in shoppers boxes. Um, so it could be quite like, even just like a handwritten note uh, with the URL um, written out really clearly for them to like input themselves. I mean, that would probably have quite a low take up um, but it's also like a you know, low um, input from you if you've got a small customer base to have that personal touch. Um, and also you, I think this might be my next slide or I might have skipped past that slide, um, but share on your social media regularly. I would say maybe every week or every other week, maybe every other week, just remind people that you have an email list and that they can sign up and share a link to your sign up page. I mean, it's basically around committing to taking action to get more, more of your audience on your social media in particular, to sign up to your email list. The reason why this is important is because um, things change on social, me social media all the time. You heard me talk about the algorithm earlier. The algorithm changed in 2016 and then suddenly businesses got very little, like compared to before, very little reach. And so they can change anything at any point, but your email list is yours. So it's a lot that having that point of contact with your customers is simply the safest way to rate, to maintain that relationship um, and make sure that you can reach them. So I think I'm losing my voice a bit. I knew this was going to be quite a kind of me talking heavy session, so sorry for that. And uh, also here is an action plan. Um, it's like a downloadable PDF with some links in for more information. And this kind of takes you step by step through some of the things that I've talked about today. Theory is that if you go through this checklist, by the time you get to the bottom, your email marketing will be in a better place than probably I'd say 90% of small businesses. Um, so might be a good place to, to get started. So that I'll share the slides in the event pages so you can access this and download it and work through it in your own pace. And tomorrow, um, as I mentioned, I'm doing an email marketing workshop, which is gonna be much more um, where I can literally help to one with anything you're struggling with and deal with your own particular issues you might be having and that's it 